fail in developing a multi-criteria decision analysis framework by which uh, she can take the prefer preferences of uh, different stakeholders and say, look, if you prefer these sorts of characteristics of your system, you should be more over here versus under these conditions, you might be more over here. So that's one side of it. We're moving towards um, agent-based modeling. So this is not ours. This is from Oak Ridge National Lab. We've been uh, getting conversations going with them about their uh, supercomputer over there, Titan, that uh, they've done some agent-based modeling on. And they're really interested in partnering with us. So we've been uh, working with them about uh, developing, basically, a uh, more rigorous assessment to be able to understand if we knock out components of the infrastructure, how might travel behavior change? Right, so if you want to do this, uh, the transportation folks who have done modeling in here will tell you that uh, the, uh, to, in order to do a large geographic area going into like a mesoscale model um, is difficult. I mean, a microscale model is, is next to impossible, uh, but going to a mesoscale model is difficult. Uh, so we've been looking at the potential of doing an um, agent-based model as a nice compromise. Access. So uh, let me talk about accessibility, which was the second point. When there is extreme heat, people need to seek refuge from that heat, right? So um, we air, uh, air conditioning penetration in Phoenix is like 94, 96 percent. It's exactly what you would expect. In a place like Los Angeles, it's closer to 60 percent. And if you go to the coast, you have very little air conditioning. If you go inland in LA, it essentially becomes uh, Mojave Desert, Riverside is essentially Mojave Desert, which is Phoenix-like conditions where you have almost 100% penetration of AC. So the characteristics of the infrastructure are really important here when we think about refuge from heat, right? So we raise this question of how do people get reprieve from heat when there's a heat wave? And yes, there's you know folks like homeless people who don't have access to air conditioning, but then there's folks like us. And you know, none of us really need to worry, you know, if you were living in Phoenix, you don't really need to worry about air conditioning. You always are able to get it either in your home or you're able to pay for it in some other form, right? Like you're able to go to a coffee shop or a movie theater or an indoor mall where you can spend some amount of time at some cost to you. So when we took up this question probably three years ago, um, how do people access heat reprieve? What was known at the time was largely that there are these county cooling centers, so LA on the left, Phoenix on the right, and these cooling centers, which we call Tier 1, are county designated spaces where you can just go and sit. It's so largely for, um, for homeless people. So we said, okay, what we wanted to do is, was ask the question of, uh, if you have these cooling centers that are randomly dispersed, because there's no logic really to why they put them down the way they do, it's just who's willing to have their doors open, then uh, does that make a difference in protecting people from heat? So we got all these hospitalization and, and death records, um, and we basically tried to do this sort of correlation uh, and, and regression to see if it was significant. And we quickly realized we're not going to find anything because the majority of the population doesn't actually use these <coughs> sorts of things, right? Where do we go? Um, well, it turns out that libraries, actually the American Library Association, the ALA, has an open door policy. So libraries uh, don't turn people away who are in need. And the other is commercial space, which is where most of us end up. So we, uh, I had a wonderful undergraduate spend her summer taking the building assessor database. And for about uh, 1,500 use codes in Phoenix, and about 800 use codes in LA, by the way, the newer the assessor databases are, uh, the richer the data are for them. Because uh, we became smarter about how we wanted to characterize things. So places like LA, which have older databases, tend not to have the richness of assessor databases compared to places like Phoenix. So uh, we had an undergrad basically spend her summer saying, okay, if I'm at a mall, how much does it cost me and how much time can I spend there? And the mall might be like eight hours at very low cost because you can just hang out in public spaces. If you go to a movie theater, it might cost you, you know, 10 to $20 and you can stay for two hours. If you go to a gas station, uh, it might cost you $2 for a pack of gum, but you can stay for a minute, right? So you can see this sort of waiting starting to appear of non-residential spaces across your urban environment based on time and cost. Where the county cooling center is free, the libraries are free, and you can stay pretty much all day. Whereas the other end of the spectrum, you have this um, uh, heterogeneity of, of uh, commercial space where you don't quite have it. So we developed these accessibility indices um, based on not only time and cost, but also based on 
uh, your ability to walk to them in a certain amount of time, right? So we looked at all the residences. Um, we did this simulation of their shortest path and uh, asked uh, how many places could they get to in a uh, reasonable, amount, reasonable amount of walking time to basically get a sense of how accessible heat refuges are across all those categories across both cities. And you can see pockets across LA, right? So these are essentially pockets of mixed use and commercial establishments popping up in certain places. In Phoenix, you see a really different um, pattern emerge, which is one where the downtown is uh, much more accessible with many more opportunities for refuges. And as you go out, those diminish. Alex, can I put you on a spot? Why is that? Um, he, Alex lived downtown. Sorry, I was, I was trying to look at the scale of that. So downtown, downtown, downtown Phoenix tends to be denser and much more walkable compared to what do you get out here? Oh, just like massive sprawl. Massive sprawl, yeah. So downtown tends to have mixed use, tends to have uh, gridded street networks, which make a difference in walkability, right, as opposed to cul-de-sacs. Uh, it tends to have a lot more density of, of uh, non-residential or commercial refuges, basically, compared to the urban fringes. So, um, you know, we then naturally ask the question, well, let's reorient the heat refuges, right? Let's take the county refuges and let's put them in places where they're more useful. So one of my postdocs has been working on this uh, facility location cover problem with Mike Kubi, uh, where we've been basically saying, given the confluence of social vulnerability, which we have from morbidity mortality data, and where heat refuges uh, currently are and where there are none, essentially, how do we relocate cooling centers um, at the beginning of the heat season to be more effectively covering people, right? So believe it or not, I've not heard of a city that uh, actually uses any sort of um, logic, for lack of a better word, of locating cooling centers. So I bet you Atlanta has cooling centers. I bet you there are refuges where you can get uh, reprieve from heat or water. And I have not yet heard of a city that actually uses social vulnerability data or any sort of information about the urban, urban cover uh, to actually place them. So we're doing this for Phoenix and LA. Uh, exposure and routing. So <clears throat> I was in London a couple years ago, and I really like these posters. Um, they're from 1927, it's two top left. Uh, when, it's, uh, when it's hot out, the underground is cooler below. And when it's uh, warm out, you know, it's, it's cooler, right? The opposite. So uh, these posters were created in 1927, 1927 by uh, an artist that made about four or 500 of them for the underground. Um, transit necessitates environmental exposure, right? So we can think about when it's 120 degrees out, how we uh, make people vulnerable just by having to access transit. And access is a function of two things. What is that? Access includes what? Walking, I'll give you the first one. And does the vehicle show up right away when you show up at the transit stop? You didn't expect me to ask you questions, did you? I'm just supposed to come. That's what happens. Waiting. Walking and waiting are big ones, right? There could be others, but walking and waiting. Um, so yes, there's, there's things like transferring between routes and so on. So we created um, a basic measure of exposure. This is downtown LA, where we, uh, we layered wait time and walk time. So the neighborhoods, which are census tracts, I believe, are walk time. So the darker the red the neighborhood is, the more walk time you have to your transit stop, okay? And we did this through a um, uh, network analysis, basically, of uh, for each residence, there's uh, 2.5 million, no, sorry, 1.5 million residences in LA, so for each of them, we simulated uh, how long it would take them to walk to the nearest transit stop. That's not necessarily the stop that they would use, but let's start there, because it's really, actually really difficult to figure out which stop people use in uh, transit ridership. Uh, we haven't been able to figure that one out. The circles are wait time. So once you get there, you have to wait, right? So typically when we don't know anything else, we just assume it's half the headway. 
but we can actually do better than that from travel surveys. So we can, uh, we actually looked at for each line that people were using um, from onboard travel surveys, how much they had to wait. So we can actually draw distributions. And as you uh, might suspect, when the headways are shorter, you are closer to half the headway. And when the headways are longer, you're actually, the distribution is scaled, uh, shifted more towards people actually showing up closer to when the vehicle is supposed to arrive. Question. Uh, the network model, did it assume they were walking by the side of the road or do you actually have the sidewalks in the model? Uh, we assumed that they were walking by the side of the road, yeah. We didn't have a sidewalk layer to do this, okay. yeah, which absolutely makes a difference. Uh, so if you have sidewalk layers, Phoenix just created their first sidewalk layer because uh, we had no idea where people uh, were walking and we wanted to, to do this, so they actually just commissioned their first one. Um, LA, I don't think, had one, so yeah, that does make a difference. Where the circles are big and the areas are dark, you have high walk time and high wait time, which means high exposure time, right? So we looked at, for both cities, what this exposure time meant in terms of where people lived and where the transit routes were, and we asked the question of how would you reroute transit in, for example, a heat wave, which LA has experienced recently and Phoenix routinely experiences, to minimize exposure, right? So this is a question that nobody has uh, really asked in the context of heat. How much you reroute vehicles or put more vehicles on the routes to minimize exposure? And when I say how would you do that, it's a function of not only the network, but also who needs them, right? So if we can overlay on top of this social vulnerability, Population intrinsic characteristics, which could just be morbidity mortality, or it could be you know low income and, and all the sort of standard fare variables that tend to show significance of, of vulnerability. Then um, how would you reroute vehicles? And that's uh, where we are today, basically um, developing a rerouting uh, algorithm for not only putting more vehicles on the route but um, shifting those routes. Third, uh, fourth. Uh, way that we're thinking about this uh, set of problems, um, interdependent critical infrastructure. So when we talk about resilience, we often talk within the system. Uh, we're often trained to think within the system. So if we want to make the transportation system more resilient, we can do some of the things that I've already talked about, um, or we can you know, do things like uh, making sure that you know, people are less vulnerable given the orientation of the network. The reality is that these systems are interdependent, and uh, they are uh, highly interconnected with each other, meaning that if something goes out in the power system or the water system, it's largely, it's likely to affect the transportation network, right? So uh, we have been working, we have an NSF project that has been going on for three or so years, and we've begun to develop what's called the Resilient Infrastructure Simulation Environment. It's a Google map that you pull up and you can drop pins down and connect them and then insert the governing equations of what's going on at the pin or on the line, the link that's connecting them, to simulate not only the individual system, so power in the top left, water in the bottom left, you see the transportation network behind it, but also how they're interconnected with each other. So the orange and the blue connect. Water requires pumping which requires a connection to the power system. Transportation requires um, electricity for things like signaling and control, whether it's your traffic light um, or you know, control of, say, a train system, but propulsion, right? So when you think about propulsion of a light rail train, um, requires electricity. And then you, know, you can go back to this life cycle stuff that I mentioned to you before. Uh, if you don't have power, you're not gonna be able to refine fuel. If you don't have water, you're not gonna be able to refine fuel, so you can go even further back, but that's not really what's going on here. So we're looking just within sort of a, a direct effect sort of a, a simulation. So we have been linking power water transport together, and we're able to simulate how impacts in one system propagate through the other. So this gets at those sort of two larger concepts that I was mentioning earlier, complexity and also this vulnerability propagation through these systems. So we can do things like, uh, say, heat knocked out a transformer. Uh, that means that reactive power then comes online to fill in uh, the loss to that neighborhood. 
uh, which puts a burden on, on the power system. You get a blackout. The blackout affects your ability to pump water in a neighborhood. It also knocks out traffic signals in a neighborhood. Uh, as a response, we've actually done this with uh, infrastructure managers. You bring them in the room and you, what do you think they do? They behave like they've been trained to behave. Like all good engineers, they fix their own system at the cost of the other system. <laughs> and in this example, what they do, so we literally have them around a the table playing, playing this. We, we gamify it. So this is one thing that we do for outreach. Not just simulations, but we actually uh, put it in the form of a game where uh, you let them play it a few times and you see how the system cascades when they behave like they normally do. And then you give them a little bit of information. You say, you know what? Uh, this strategy could have helped here, or uh, upgrading this component proactively could have helped there, could have helped you prevent it. Um, you know, picking the more robust transformer so that that power outage wouldn't have happened when you had a heat wave at 120 degrees because your transformer was rated up to 120. You should have bought the one that was rated up to 150 for a little bit more money sort of thing. And then you let them play it again. You can see the learning, right? So the cascade doesn't happen. When they play it for the first time, to finish my example, uh, power goes out, water goes out. Somebody at the uh, water system then requests more power to be pushed to the pumps because people are not getting water in their houses, which then puts more burden and actually, on the power system and it actually blows out the blackout on a larger scale sort of thing. So you can see this interdependency, uh, power to water to power happening. So um, we've been connecting this to transport. Uh, and the idea is that ultimately we want to connect uh, you know, something like a traffic simulation, an agent-based model, uh, to be able to say, well, when these systems go out, how is that affecting uh, transport? Or um, more critically, if there's no transport, how do you actually get people and parts to these other infrastructure systems to bring them back online? So more of the emergency response, uh, emergency recovery phases of the, of the system. Um, we've done a lot of work characterizing these other systems. I won't go into it. Some work that we've done showing uh, power generation losses with climate change, both in terms of uh, stream flow losses as well as temperature rise is going to affect uh, the thermoelectric generating capacity of uh, thermoelectric power plants. And uh, ultimately, trying to connect all these things together to get at some of the complexity. Uh, yeah, it's a spaghetti diagram, but it gives you a sense of the complexity that's involved in so with that, I'll end. Hopefully I've given you guys a, a decent overview of the ways in which we're approaching this problem. So we are doing the hardening type stuff of, you know, how do we uh, spec the bigger, stronger component, build things higher, and uh, uh, more likely to withstand these events that were in the past one in uh, 100 years, but are now becoming one in 10 years. Uh, but we're also trying to think about it in terms of these other, um, these other ways. So thank you all very much. Ten minutes for yes, we have ten minutes for questions. Alex, so um, I'm interested in the cooling center access piece. So you mentioned initially the sort of state-sponsored cooling centers weren't well used. So you knew that you weren't going to find. We're well located. Okay. So, but how they're used is actually um, a really interesting question. Okay. So yeah, I guess I have a, a several. Um, one is I wanted to know if you have like, qualitative information about how people are actually using these things, and is that why you included libraries and commercial space, but didn't include something like the public transit system, which yes. is basically like a moving air it's a moving, it's a moving cooling center. And then, when you included all that stuff, did you rerun those correlations to see if you could find a relationship between access yeah. and better health? Great. Uh, when it comes to how people protect themselves from extreme events, there's little information, right? So um, Dave Handula, who's one of our heat researchers who works a lot with Brian Stone here, uh, those two folks have been uh, getting at some of these questions of how people use these refuges. And to do that, they run surveys, right? So they ask, uh, during a heat wave, they show up there, they send a bunch of grad students out, and they, they ask them a bunch of questions. And uh, anybody want to take a guess at why people show up at heat refuges? These are like, so I'll give you a clue, these are like um, ca uh, community centers, senior centers. These are county-run spaces that the county can give resources to 
to act as a refuge in a heat event so that anybody could then uh, show up. So senior center or county center, anybody want to guess why somebody would show up there? It's not because of heat reprieve. That's not the reason people show up. Food. What was that? Food. Food. Um, they don't give them food. They do give them water. Bingo. Okay? <laughs> This was one of the top reasons why people were there during heat. So there's a communication issue, right? So uh, one, communication, like are you aware that you have this thing in your neighborhood that you can go to if you don't have AC? So there's a lot of really interesting questions about behavior and heat. Um, you know, questions like, uh, you know, when we look at the 100 deaths in Phoenix, roughly a third of them are voluntary exposure to heat. And it's not all old people, believe it or not. Um, last year we had, a fitness instructor at the ripe old age of 25 who was out hiking with her three female doctor friends who uh, suffered from heat exhaustion, ultimately cardiac arrest, and her three doctor friends could do nothing for her on a hiking trail in the middle of Phoenix. So we have a lot of uh, parks that are sort of like mountain parks right in the middle of the urban center, and that was one, one of the, so a third of deaths are roughly voluntary exposure to heat. So then it's what's happening with the other two thirds, right? And uh, you know you get into questions about uh, whether or not people are even turning their air conditioners on, uh, whether they can afford to do it. So you might imagine a low-income person might uh, let their temperature, indoor temperature, get up to you know 90 degrees, 85, something like that, before they're willing to turn it on because they want to save money. We have no insight into any of these sorts of behaviors. Uh, yes. Uh, Transit systems are mobile cooling centers. So this is not something that was built into uh, what we showed there. It's something that we are thinking about, but really haven't done anything on it. Um, no, we've, we've just run the models the way that you've seen it in terms of, uh, in terms of who has access given you know, the street networks and, and that sort of thing. Um, they haven't thought about yet this next step.